All right, good morning. Uh, if you would open your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. So I want to continue this morning with uh, what we were doing last Sunday. We started a lesson titled, uh, Mastering the Critical Issues of the Gospel. And we didn't get very far. There were three things I was going to say. We only got through one. But I do want to, I do want to write up on here what the first one is. Uh, mastering the three critical issues. The first issue, again, and I'm not going to be as detailed in this like I was last Sunday because I want to move on to the next point. But the first point is that all men are what? Sinners. All men are sinners. Okay? And sin, and sin separates men from God. Okay? So we went over this point last week, right? We Again, we reiterated the, the idea that, uh, go to Romans chapter 3, look at verse 23. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, verse 23, most of you I know can quote this verse. For all have what? Sin and come short of the glory of God. So we talked about this last, last Sunday. Mastering the critical issues of the gospel is, number one, all men are sinners and sin separates man from God, right? So uh, man is not automatically born into a state of forgiveness. Man is born in Adam, dead in trespasses and sins. Last Sunday we talked about the essence of sin as in three ways. We talked about it as the me first autonomy of demanding our own way. Second, we talked about the life of rebellion or denying the will of God and what God says is true in His Word. And then third, we talked about the selfishness and the unrighteousness that, uh, that exists in man as he seeks to please his own, his own uh, interests and so forth, right? Then we looked at the fact that sin has consequences and that if you go to Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is what? Death, right? So we talked about the fact that sin has a fearful consequence and the consequence of sin is death. And so we looked at uh, some verses that, that discuss that the penalty of sin is death. We looked at three different kinds of death, right? We looked at physical death, the separation of your soul from your body. We looked at spiritual death, the idea that man is born spiritually dead to the life of God, that he needs regeneration, he needs redemption, he needs justification, he needs forgiveness, he needs reconciliation, right? None of those things are automatic because of the condition that man is born into. And then ultimately we looked at the issue of the second death in Revelation chapter 20 and we saw that the second death is separation from, from the presence of God forever in the lake of fire. And we, we talked about some things related to that, right? So not going to go over all those things in the same detail we did last Sunday. Just want to review those basic points with you here at the beginning. So before we move on, did anybody have any uh, thoughts, questions, or comments that you've thought of since last week uh, that you would like to ask before we move on to the next point? All right. So you're in Romans 6, verse 23. We kind of ended with this, right? That... Romans 6.23 does not end with the wages of sin is death. There's more to that verse, right? It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? So, so there's, there's a gift aspect of this. There's a gift element. The, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's, he's offering eternal life as a free what? Thank you. As a free gift, okay? Now, free to who? Free to us, right? It's free to us because did he pay the price? Did the Lord Jesus Christ pay the necessary price, right? So therefore, on the basis of the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Godhead can offer us salvation today as a free gift, as it says in the verse, through who? Jesus through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? So again... You don't have the free gift. You don't have eternal life. You don't have forgiveness of sins, justification, and reconciliation unless you are in who? Christ. In Christ. These things only come through Christ, through faith in the finished work of Christ. So this brings us then to the, to the second point here in terms of mastering the critical issues of the gospel. The second point is that Calvary... Is God's 
only solution for sin or for man's sin. Okay, so this one says all men are sinners and men separates, uh, sin separates man from God. This one is saying that Calvary is the only solution for man's sin. Okay, so if you are in point number one, if you're dead in trespasses and sins, if you're dead to the life of God, if you have the wrath of God abiding upon you, can you do anything, can you produce anything in that state that God will accept as far as righteousness is concerned? No, okay? The only thing that God is going to accept is the sacrifice of His Son for our sins on Calvary, okay? So we need to look at some things as it pertains to that. So just to be clear, at this point these are probably review, but we should state them again. Number one, okay? We are not saved by our performance, but through Christ's sacrifice. Okay, we are not saved through our performance, but through Christ's sacrifice. Man has so many false hopes which are rooted in his performance. Right? As we talked about last Sunday, man thinks that he's okay. Man thinks that he can bring forth something that God will accept of his own merit on his own effort. Right? But we know that because of point number one, that sin separates man from God, because all are sinners, God is not going to accept what man can produce and perform on his own. So, number two, Calvary is God's only provision. The work of Christ cannot be mixed with religious rights and moral obligations. Okay? Now... I'm sure you've all encountered people that will talk a lot about the death of Christ. But then they will also talk a lot about what they think they're going to contribute to that equation, right? Their own church going, their own offering, their own, you know, charitable giving, whatever it is, you fill in the blank, right? There's the idea or the notion that they think that they can do something to help this equation out, right? To do something to help out what God did. Um, I think a lot of church-going people will say that they believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again. The issue, though, is are they relying, we're going to get to this in point number three, but are they relying and trusting exclusively on what Christ did on their behalf, or are they also thinking that they're bringing something into this of their own effort, of their own performance, of their own works, okay? So the only solution to the problem is provided through the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Third, the saving work of Christ is finished. All right, It's done. Because we do not await the outcome of any contingencies. Right? Christ says as He hangs on the cross, He says, it is what? <laughs> finished. Right? Did the Lord Jesus Christ totally and completely for all time satisfy the righteous requirements of the law. Yes. And in doing so, he made a way for us to become, for us to be saved, right? For us to have the forgiveness of sins, for us to um, pass from death unto life, for us to get out of Adam and to get into Christ. So I want to look at some verses here about point number two. So come back with me to Romans 3. <coughs> There are, again, there are just a lot of verses that we could go to on this, right? To highlight and accentuate the fact that Calvary is God's only solution for man's sin. There are a ton of verses that we could look at. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is where? Okay. So the redemption is where? In Christ, okay? Why is the redemption in Christ? Because he's, he's the one that paid the redemption price, right? Now, I'm not going to do it today, but we could get into the three Greek words associated with the word redemption. We could talk about the definition of redemption as, as uh, to deliver uh, by paying the price. We could look at a lot of things, but the ultimate, the ultimate reality is that you were dead in sin, you were a slave to sin, the Lord Jesus Christ entered into that market and redeemed you out of it by paying the necessary redemption price. That's the, that is the core fundamental root reality of the situation, right? 
if you are dead in sin, Christ went and paid the price, right? Now, just because Christ paid the price, does that automatically mean you're not dead in sin? You have to trust the provision that was made for you in this case, right? And the provision that was made for you was the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 25. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation, that's a totally satisfying sacrifice, through faith in His what? Blood. Okay? Through faith in His blood. blood. The Lord Jesus Christ shed His blood in payment for what? Sin, right? Hold your hand there and come over to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> we'll be talking a lot more about this later. This morning, 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 3. For I deliver unto you that, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for what? Our sins. Okay? Why did Christ die? He died to pay for our sins, right? When He died on the cross, did He shed His blood in payment for those sins? Okay? So go back to Romans 3, verse 25. Who gave, uh, verse 25, who God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, there's some dispensational things going on there, too, that we're not going to necessarily get into right now, okay? But the point is, is that there's propitiation, there's totally satisfying sacrifice that is made available not through your work, not through my work, not through our performance and effort, but through the blood that the Lord Jesus Christ shed there when he died where? On the cross. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 says that he died for our what? Sins. Okay? You guys with that? Um, look at verse, uh, let's, let's go to chapter 4, Romans chapter 4. Verse 25. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. It says, Who was delivered for our offenses. Now, what are, what is, what, what are your offenses a reference to? Sin. The sin, right? The offenses, the iniquity, the sins, those words are referring to the fact that Christ dies for sin where? On the cross. On the cross. Right? That is where the sin debt was paid. That is where the price and, and, and the payment was made for sin. It was on the cross, right? Now look at how verse 25 ends. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our what? Now do you see how do you see how you need both of those things, right? You need Christ's death upon the cross to pay for the sin, but you also need his resurrection from what? The dead in order for you to be what? Justified, right? That's why when we talk about the finished work of Christ, or the complete work, we're talking about the death, the burial, and what? Resurrection. The resurrection, right? All, it is our faith in that work of, uh, work of Christ on our behalf that saves us from our sin, right? That forgives us, that justifies us, that redeems us, and all those, all those concepts here that we've been sort of looking at, right? So, look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet what? Sinners. Sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? You have to understand, the death on the cross was specifically for sin. Right? The blood that was shed on the cross was specifically for sin. You could go through all of these things about, the, uh, about uh, cursed is him that hangeth upon a what? Tree. Tree, right? We could talk about the fact that on that cross did God the Father turn his back on the Son. Right? He said, my God, my God, why have you what? 
forsaken me, right? Because the Lord Jesus Christ, as he hung upon the cross, he became so identified with our sin, with the sin of humanity, that God the Father could no longer look upon him as he hung there on the cross, right? That's about as close to heresy as you can get and still be orthodox, right? Jesus, did Jesus Christ deserve it? Was he himself a sinner? No, no. Come to 2 Corinthians 5. Scriptures are real clear about this. Okay? Jesus Christ was made sin. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. <clears throat> For he hath made him, that's God, that's, that's God at the end of verse 20. For he hath made him, that's Christ. So God the Father made the Son. For he hath made him to be sin for us. So, does the Godhead consider the sacrificial death of Christ as sufficient to settle the sin issue? Yes. yes, okay. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So again, is this automatic? No. It is not automatic. Okay. It explicitly states that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You are only made the righteous of God if you are in him. If you are not in Him, you are not made the righteous of God. Because you're not in who? Christ. You're not in Christ. You're not in Him. It's very simple. Okay, now I know there are those that would want to complicate this. But it is fundamentally, extremely what? Simple message, right? Paul talks about the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel is, number one, I'm a what? Sinner, my sin separates me from God. Number two, the only provision, the only solution for my problem here is, is the cross work of who? Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Does, it, does anybody have any questions or comments? If you do, by, by all means, uh, make sure you let me know. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse, uh, for the sake of time, just look at verse 6. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted, where? In the beloved, in whom, now, now notice, in whom we have what? Redemption. How? Through His what? Through His blood. Okay? So the blood is only, the, the blood is applied to those who are in who? Christ. Christ. Okay? If you are not in Christ, if you are still in Adam, do you have the, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to your account yet? No. Okay? Not in Adam. Verse 7. In whom we have redemption. So you have redemption in who? In Christ. If you're not in Christ, you have redemption. No, hold your hand there and go back to Romans 3. And notice again. Verse 24. Being justified freely by, through his, uh, freely by his grace... Through the redemption that is in who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. So, justification and redemption are only the reality for those who are where? In Christ. In Christ. Okay? <laughs> Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? So the Godhead's solution for your, our predicament, our problem, was the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That, that's the issue. Go back to Ephesians 1. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His what? Now, you see, you see how that verse says, according to the riches of His grace? What did Romans 3.24 say? It says, being justified, how? Freely, Freely by His grace. grace. Right? 
So if, if you go back to uh, Ephesians 1, 7 again, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, right? So who has the forgiveness of sins in verse 7? Those who are where? In Christ. In Christ. Go back to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In who? In Christ. <clears throat> in Christ. Okay? So, redemption <clears throat> and forgiveness of sins are <clears throat> for those who are where? In Christ. In Christ. Go over to Colossians. <clears throat> Verse 14, Colossians 1, verse 14. Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have what? Redemption. Redemption. How? Through his blood. Right? Romans 3, 25, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his what? Blood. blood. Right? Through faith in his blood. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even what? The forgiveness. Now, folks, the, the, the phrase, even the forgiveness of sins, needs to be there. Okay? I know that the critical text in the modern versions, they leave that out. They leave out. They, I'm sorry, they leave out through his blood. That's what they leave out. They leave out the blood there in that verse. My mistake. Thanks for pointing that out, Ron. They leave out redemption. The, 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 that verse will say, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. Folks, there is no redemption and there is no forgiveness of sins without the blood of who? Christ. Without the blood of Christ, right? Now, somebody is saying, well, you know, it says blood in, in Ephesians. Yeah. That's not the point, okay? The point is, does it, should it say blood there? Yeah. Well, the majority of the manuscript evidence that we have suggests that it should say what? Yeah. That it should say blood there, right? This is an important issue. So, the redemption, we ha in whom we have redemption, how? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So if I have, if, if a person in this condition of number one has not yet applied by faith that, that propitiation, that provision, that sacrifice, that shed blood for their individual sins, are they forgiven yet? No. no. Has the provision been made? Has Christ paid the price? Has all that stuff been, been done and accomplished, right? But in order for these things, we're getting to the next point here, number three, which is going to be that you have to buy faith what? Believe. Believe this message, okay? But does everybody see there that the redemption and the forgiveness are explicitly stated to be through his what? Blood, okay? So it says that in, in Romans 3, it says that in Ephesians 1, it says that in Colossians 1, it says that in a bunch of places, and the reason it says that is because Calvary is God's only solution for man's what? Sin. If man could save himself, if man could take care of his own sin problem and, and pay off his own sin debt before God Almighty, would the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ have even been necessary? No. No. Okay. Uh, let's go to look at at least one more. Go to Colossians 2. Now, look at verse 13. Colossians 2, 13. And you being dead... In your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, that was the Colossians before they were what? In Christ. in Christ. Okay. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all what? You are not forgiven of all trespasses until you've been quickened together with who? Christ. With Christ. Okay? So the cross, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, Calvary is the only solution for sin. So let me just use just a brief illustration. I don't ever claim that my illustrations are perfect illustrations, but they're 
hopefully sufficient nonetheless, okay? So the illustration. <clears throat> Sins, uh, the, sin was placed on who? Christ. Christ, right? So, while the gift is free to you, that it cost the Godhead the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? If you're dealing with somebody about the gospel and, 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 and mastering the critical issues of the gospel and trying to share Christ with them as an ambassador, you have to get them to understand that very simple thing, right? And I've used this illustration before. I have in the past bought my children gifts, right? I went to the store. I paid the price that they were asking for the gift, right? So did I redeem the gift by paying the price? Okay. Then the time comes where I present the gift to my children, but they have to do what? Receive it. They have to receive it. They have to receive the gift. They have to say, okay, I accept that as what? My own. My own. Okay. Romans 6.23, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Eternal life. Through, Jesus Through who? Jesus Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. So before we go on to the next point, does anybody have any questions or comments about that? About what we've said so far here? Fred? Yeah, I just want to make a comment about uh, Colossians 1.14 where they, modern translations, leave out the, through his blood. What they're doing is removing the price that was paid for the redemption. Yeah. And, the, and there's no <coughs> completed redemption without the price being paid. So, just like the transaction you talked about by going to the store, if you didn't pay the price for the, you wouldn't have had the. So, how many of you think that having the blood of Christ in Colossians one fourteen is a pretty important doctrinal issue? Very important. Yeah. Okay. So the modern modern version advocates will often say the following. They'll say, "Well, you know." There's no, none of these changes really affect any fundamental doctrine. Don't, have you heard them say that? Yeah. Okay. And, and then you'll bring up this verse right here, Colossians 1, 14, and they'll say, well, okay, it's not, yeah, it's not there, but does it need to be there because it is in Ephesians 1? So go back to Ephesians 1, look at verse 7. <clears throat> Ephesians 1 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. See, it's there, that's not in dispute, no fundamental doctrine has changed. Okay, I don't believe that. Because you have to understand that when the New Testament was written, did they receive it all bound together in one nice little book? No. no. So when Paul wrote the Colossians and they originally received the letter from Paul, do you think it's pretty important whether or not through his blood is in verse 14 of chapter 1? Okay. So what they'll say, so, the, so what James White and folks like him will say then is they'll say, well, the scribe that copied Colossians knew the longer reading out of Ephesians. And so as he's copying Colossians, he inadvertently inserts that through his blood into Colossians 1.14 because he was familiar with the longer reading in Ephesians and what he's trying to do is harmonize Ephesians and Colossians. That's, it. That's what he says. Who said that? James White. I've got it in his book, The King James Only Controversy. That's how he explains it. Airman says that as well. Airman says that. A lot of them say that. Okay. The problem with that is it says nothing about whether or not through his blood ought to be in Colossians 1.14. You've just developed a way to try to explain away why a fundamental piece of doctrine is missing from the critical text in a modern version. That's all you've done. Is everybody following what I'm saying? So Fred, I agree. It absolutely is a doctrinal issue. Okay? So that is the explanation that's given, and that is what is passing off today as 
highbrow scholarship for somebody to say that. Okay, but you have to understand that's that is the kind of reasoning and excuse making and logic that is being used, and it doesn't fundamentally answer the question of whether or not that phrase should have been in that verse. I believe it should have been there, and I believe the Colossians needed it to be there when they received the epistle in order to accurately understand how they have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Okay? Anybody have a follow-up comment or question on that point? Just as an unsaved person may come along today and start reading the book of Colossians, doesn't know anything about the Bible, start reading the book of Colossians, come across there, he wouldn't even know that. Yeah, it, it is immaterial to him whatever the excuse some guy has for why it shouldn't be there. Yeah. Okay? It doesn't necessarily have to be some guy. I mean, a lot of preachers are doing it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not like the old days where that many kids coming out of seminary nowadays actually know their Bible. If they study Colossians, they might teach something and not even know the Ephesians passage necessarily existed. <laughs> That's sad reality, too. <laughs> So the idea of the idea, well, the the scribe is trying to hard. First of all, how does think about this for a minute? How does White or Airman even know that? How do they know? Because it's just their theory. Because have they ever seen the original a day in their life? No. No. So how do they know that it shouldn't be there? And some scribe tried to harmonize Ephesians and Colossians. It is total, complete speculation. Ron, was your hand up? Yeah, well, this is the thing. Okay, the people that didn't hear Paul or whatever in Colossae, then if they only had the original writing for a while, then they were saved. Not if the blood's missing. That's what I'm saying. And they were believing what Paul wrote to them. Those guys, that's what I'm saying. With those guys, they, they couldn't have got saved until the scribe made a mistake or before they got another letter or talked to somebody else. Oh, it's pretty important. So I'm sure you guys all know that sort of off to the side, I continue to study certain things related to textual issues and, and some of this sort of thing, right? I ran across recently a quotation from Tertullian. The church father Tertullian, he wrote in about the year 200, and he's talking about how to combat heresy, and he's writing to this guy, and I'm paraphrasing right now because I don't have the actual quotation in front of me, but he talks about the authentic writings of the churches and then he tells the guy to go to Rome, Colossae, Corinth, Thessalonica and Philippi if he wants to know what God said. Now think about that. I've always believed, I've, it has always been my belief that when the Colossians received this letter from Paul they made copies of it, distributed out the copies but they kept what? They kept the one Paul sent them, right? Same thing with Ephesians, same thing with all the letters that Paul wrote, right? If Tertullian seems to be saying what I think he is saying, then that means that all the way up to the year 200, the original copy was still what? Was still available to be referenced for what the reading should be. Okay? That's huge, because that, that, puts, that puts the original all the way out to the year, roughly the year 200 A.D., that, 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 the, that the original book of Colossians was still in existence. So that means that anybody could have gone back. If there was a question about what that should say, they still could have went back and what? Looked at it. Okay? They needed it to say in his blood when they received the letter in Colossae, because are there other people? Paul went to Colossae. Did he go to Colossae? No. No. They, so he, they, they need to say that in order for the doctrine to be accurately what? Correct. Communicated to them. Is everybody with that? Any, any other questions or comments about that? You know, and unfortunately I have to agree with what Nate said. Just because somebody comes out of seminary today doesn't mean they know that it says it in Ephesians 1. In fact, never mind. <laughs> I just stopped there. <laughs> but we have, so number one is that all men are what? Sinners, okay? Number two, Calvary is God's only solution for man's sin, right? So then the question is, so then the next sort of bridging here is, how does one 
reach out? How does one receive the gift of eternal life? Through what? Through faith. Okay. So I'm going to write number three up here. So the, the issue here is, I'm going to write a small statement and then a little bit longer one. The issue here is exercising, saving, what? Faith. Faith. Okay? So my longer statement is claiming by personal choice. And relying exclusively upon Christ's work <coughs> on the cross. To be the sufficient payment for my sin. So, is the person's will involved in this? person's will is what? They, they got to make a decision. Okay, are they going to believe what God said? Are they going to agree with what God said? And they, are they going to trust the only thing God will accept? So let me just read that again. Exercising saving faith, claiming by personal choice, relying, and this is, this is the big one. Relying what? Exclusively. Exclusively. Okay, exclusively, not adding anything to it. Okay, exclusively upon Christ's work on the cross to be the sufficient payment for my sin. That's the issue. Okay, so the choice, the per, a person's will is involved here. The gift of eternal life is available to anyone who will claim it for his or herself. And when I say that, I don't mean like some name it, claim it thing. I mean claim it by receive it. How? By faith, right? So like I said with my other illustration, I buy the gifts. The gifts have been redeemed. The gifts have been purchased. The gifts have been paid for. But they don't belong to the person that I'm giving the gift to until they've what? Received, received it. Okay, you got to receive it. Because they could say, I didn't want that. That's exactly what most people do when it comes to the free gift of eternal life. They say, I don't want it. I don't need it, or it can't be that simple, and I need to help God out because it's, they're not doing it how? They're not trusting and relying what? Exclusively. Okay? <laughs> so, relying and trusting exclusively upon, upon the provision of Christ, salvation is as we believe. Yeah, how many have a recliner at home? A recliner? You know, you pull that lever back and you recline back, right? Okay. Just, just recline back in the trust and trusting the provision that God did what was necessary for what? Redemption, salvation, and justification. Okay. Exclusive. So we receive the gift of eternal life by exercising saving faith. Coming to Romans chapter 4. Folks, faith is not a work. Okay? Faith is not a work. Now, I have been, I have been accused recently of teaching another gospel for telling people that they must first believe and apply and trust the finished work of Christ as the only payment of sin before they're forgiven. So th this is that, that me saying that is teaching another gospel. Okay? 
Romans 4, verse 4. Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh. Okay, so the, to him that worketh. That's the guy that's up here striving, working, trying to get it how? By his own work, by his own effort, by his own performance, right? To him that worketh. What's the verse say? Is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt? Now, you remember last week we read in chapter 2 of Romans about those who are treasuring up wrath against the day of what? Wrath. Those that want to work for salvation, work for forgiveness, work for justification, they're simply accumulating more what? More debt. Okay? Now, what's, what's the first word in verse 5? But. So is, is, is he going to contrast now something in verse 5 with what he just said in verse 4? Okay? Verse 4, Now to him that worketh is reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh, what? Not, not but believeth. Right there, is believing and faith the same thing as working? No. No. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. <clears throat> Interesting. Who needs justification? The ungodly. Are the ungodly righteous or unrighteous? They're unrighteous. Are the ungodly forgiven or unforgiven? They're unforgiven. Hello. Okay. Verse 5. <clears throat> but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, <clears throat> his faith is counted for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. So that tells me two things. Number one, is faith a work? No. No. It's directly contrasted with the one who's going to work in verse 4. Right? But the faith is what God counts for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. That's why we said up here, exercising, saving what? Faith. Faith. Faith, not in your own effort, your own ability, your own performance, but faith in that provision. That finished work. Is everybody with that? <coughs> Romans 4, look at verse 20. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 4.20. Talking, you know, he's using Abraham here as an illustration, and there's a lot of things we're skipping over just because we're, we don't have time to talk about all of them right now. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to do what? See, faith, faith is being fully persuaded that what God says is enough is in fact what? Enough. enough. Is in fact true. Okay? So we see that faith is not a work. We see that faith is necessary. Faith is what's counted for righteousness. Faith is what moves you from being ungodly to being righteous, to being godly in Christ Jesus. It's faith in the finished work of Christ. Okay? Come over to Ephesians 2. I mean, you all probably know the two verses I'm going to, but we still should look at them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace, what, Romans, what, what did Romans 3.24 say? Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that's in who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are ye what? Saved. Okay, in this context, saved from what? You're saved from verse. Being dead and you're saved from verses one, two, and three, right? You, they were saved from being dead in trespasses and sin in verse one, and they were saved from being children of disobedience in verse two, and they were saved from the wrath of God in verse three. Okay, 
Now, we're going to see later on this morning, sometimes the word saved does not necessarily refer to justification or eternal salvation in the Bible. Sometimes, sometimes, people, sometimes the word saved can refer to other things that, that uh, contextually that is, are being discussed that people can be saved from, right? Okay, uh, we're, we're going to look at that later on in, uh, in, our, in our main study here after a while. But he says here, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith. Faith. You're not saved from anything until you exercise saving what? Faith. Faith and rely and trust exclusively upon Christ's work for, on, uh, you know, on your behalf, right? So verse 8, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Here it is. It's the gift of what? God. Not of works. Lest any man should what? So how is it that God can offer salvation as a free gift? Because salvation was paid for by the sacrifice of who? Christ. Christ. In order for one to receive that gift, they have to what? They have to believe, they have to rely, they have to trust on Christ's finished work. Go to chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in who? Christ. Christ. In whom, that's Christ, in whom ye also, what? Trusted. trusted after that. Ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye, what? Believed. Believed. Ye were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> Folks, before you believe that, before you trusted that gospel, before you believed what Christ did, you were dead in sin, you were in Adam, and you couldn't have smelled a blessing coming down the street, much less ever received one. Right? But then what happens is, is God the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam and puts you where? In Christ. In Christ. And seals you where? In Christ. In Christ. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession. But notice again, verse 12, you, had, you trusted. In verse 15, 13, you believed, right? And all that's coming after verse 7, where you have redemption and forgiveness of sins where? In Christ, how? His Through His blood, in verse 7, right? And whom we have redemption, how? Through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So all that is in line with the grace of God. Okay? All right, so how much time we got? Uh, 12 minutes. 12 minutes, all right. So again, I'm sort of in an awkward spot where if I go too much further, I'm going to get in the middle of something and not really be able to stop. So does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts, or observations about... <clears throat> Excuse me, what we've been uh, discussing here. Yeah, Ron? Uh, just uh, easy believism. That they, they, they say we believe it's just easy believism. Well, that, that's, that's not the case. Because if you believe it, it's just easy believism. Because we, as people, uh, tend to think that we have something we can offer. I mean, those people that say that hasn't tried just to trust exclusively on what Christ did and not do anything, right? Mm -hmm. right. Because we want it. We think there's something a little bit good in us. Right, and that's, that's that's this issue right here. Amen. I mean, that, that's 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 a key issue. Okay. If I had a dollar every time somebody said "but" after I said that message, I think I'll be tired tomorrow. <laughs> Anybody else? Go to uh, Acts 26. So in Acts 26, Paul is recounting what happened to him on the road to Damascus back in chapter 9. Okay? Acts 26. Verse uh, 15. 
So this, this is Paul later in his life and ministry recounting or retelling what happened to him in Acts 9. Okay? It says, and I, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things. What things would those be? What did it happen to him right then, right there on the road to Damascus? Now, we don't really see Paul doing that, but don't you think that that had a prominent place in Paul's preaching? You better believe it probably did, right? We don't actually ever see Paul really preach that. We see him talk about it and recount it in a few places. But don't you think that he made a point in his preaching to, to, to relay the grace that was bestowed upon him that day when God allowed him as the chief of sinners to get up out of the Arabian sand? Okay, and not, boom, not strike him dead right there? Okay, you talk about, you talk about, you talk about 2 Corinthians 5.19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. If God had imputed sin to Paul right then and right there, would he have been perfectly just to strike him dead and never do anything with that guy ever? He was a blasphemer. He was the chief of sinners. He was leading the rebellion in Israel against God Almighty, against the, their Messiah, against Jesus Christ. But instead of dealing with him in his wrath, what did God do? He bestowed grace upon him and set a pattern, according to 1 Timothy chapter 1, for them that should hereafter what? Believe. believe right? So Paul's talking about this. Verse 16, But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister both of, the things which thou, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will, what? Appear, appear unto thee, right? So, did Paul get the entire information and body of truth that God was going to commit to him right there, that day, on the road to Damascus, in the, in, in the Arabian sand? No. no. Okay? All right, verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now what? Yes, Folks, was Paul sent to the Gentiles that day in the Arabian sand? Yes. yes. The idea that he wasn't sent to the Gentiles till later is completely ridiculous. And I know somebody's going to write me and say, I'm a heretic, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, verse 18. To open their eyes. Whose eyes? Gentiles. The Gentiles. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto who? God. Ephesians 2. Were the Ephesians before they were saved, dead in trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the course charted by the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and were they by, and were they by nature the children of what? Wrath. Wrath. Verse, verse 18. To open their eyes, the Gentiles' eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto who? God. Unto God that they may receive forgiveness of what? Well, Paul, God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, clearly does not think that all of these people are all automatically what? Forgiven. forgiven. The only way they're going to get forgiven is to hear these three things and what? Believe, Believe them. Trust them exclusively. Verse 18. <coughs> How much time do I got? To open the eyes, to open their eyes, and to turn them from the power of darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. That's Colossians chapter one. Who hath translated us from the kingdom? Um, I messed it up. I'm going to go read it though. That's Colossians chapter one. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear what? The dear son. Paul was going to do that from the day he encountered Christ on the road to Damascus. Not later on, not some point later. Now I acknowledge, I acknowledge as any normal reading of this passage would, that is God going to give Paul more information as time goes on? Absolutely. But is he doing certain things beginning at that day right there? Okay. 
to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith in who? Or that is in who? Christ. In me. That's Christ. That's Christ. That is Christ talking. Okay? To Paul. In Acts 9, on the road to Damascus, do you think Christ knew what he was talking about? Yes. If Christ knew what he was talking about, then Christ clearly did not look at the whole world and think, oh, they're already what? Forgiven. Forgiven. It's absurd. Yes. It's absolutely absurd. And it's based upon a misreading of 2 Corinthians 5.19. Okay? Now, all these people out there, had, they, had, all, had their sin been paid for? The idea of not imputing their trespasses unto them is the idea that God was not going to deal with them in His what? Wrath. He was going to deal with them in His what? Grace. And He was going to give them an opportunity for them to be what? Saved. Okay? So... Before we get in, the next point I have here is how to lead a person to the point of decision. So we don't really have time to get into that, so we'll kind of get that next time. How much time we have? Three minutes, give or take. Does anybody have any other last minute comment or question? Are we going to have Sunday school next week? Oh, that's a good point. No. Next Sunday morning we're having breakfast. So thanks for reminding me. We will have this study in two weeks where we'll look at that, okay? Anything else? Just, just that Paul went into Damascus for three years after this, right? After he went with Antonius. Yep. So, yeah. everything, everything Paul is saying there, he's recounting what Christ said to him when he was still where? On the road. Right. Then he goes to Damascus, Christ appears to Ananias, Go back to Acts 9. And tells Ananias essentially the exact same thing he just told Paul. That he would be a witness. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. This is God talking to Ananias. He says, and the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he, that's he's referring to Paul there, he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my names before who? <laughs> the Gentiles. And kings, and the children of who? What does he do throughout the entire rest of the book of Acts? Exactly that. Exactly that. Okay? Alright. Thanks for your attention. Next, not next week, two weeks, we'll resume by looking at some things about leading a person to a point of decision, okay?